Okay, let me get started, guys. Please. I don't know about you, but uh, as we are approaching the end of term, you know, my body tells me I'm exhausted. I'm just having this pre-end of term cold. So please bear with me so much for, for coming down. So uh, I'm, I'm a little sick, but uh, let's hope that we, uh, that we get this and uh, we are approaching the end of this. How exciting is that? So um, today is going to be the last time I'm going to be introducing some new content. So this is the last new content. Next week, as I had mentioned, we will have revisions, you know, there's room for questions, for clarifications, for, for practical matters that you might have. So, I don't want to do anything new next week. Really just have two hours where we can revisit stuff that you guys feel that we should revisit, right? So I base that on um, what I remember from stuff that you had brought up in one of those little mini surveys that I had, but also, you know, over this week. Or, oh, by the way, I'm, 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 I'm in close touch with the tutors all the time anyway, right? Uh, but, uh, but this week in particular, I, I asked them to let me know what are the things that that keep you busy, or what are the things that um, that we can spend time on next week with the clarification, right? So if you haven't already done so, doing your tutorial, um, your tutorials are the points for that. Okay, so we are approaching the finishing line. We are getting there, and uh, um, I was asked by uh, the university to put up this information here. So uh, as every as every term uh, comes to the end. There's going to be uh, a student survey, and I was asked to put this up there. Don't do this right now. I also put it up on the Blackboard, so, so do it. It's open right now, so you can, you can start uh, uh, these surveys right now. And actually, these things do matter. They do matter. Believe me, they do matter. At the very least, they give uh, folks like me and, and other colleagues good arguments why we teach in a certain way and not in others and so on. So it really does matter. Uh, you have the whole overview. You see the other stuff that you actually get. Funnily, I don't. That's kind of actually funny. I, d I don't know how other folks teach, although I sometimes try to sneak into some other lectures. So sometimes you see me in some other lectures. I just like to do that. Um, also, just because I'm very curious in other topics that folks teach here at this university. But anyway, so this is sort of the student survey for you to fill out. Um, please do that eventually. OK. But one other mini survey for you right now. Please take out your phones. I'm just really curious in whether you guys already had a look at the exam preparation guide. What the hell is Blackboard? <laughs> what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> okay, I just really wanted to give a rough uh, impression on that. Um, you know, I can't emphasize this enough. Have a look at the exam preparation guide. You know, there, what I do in there, I really give you some further advice. On, on how to approach this exam, what to do, what not to do, and so on. Uh, you know, I believe, in, I believe in transparency in this whole thing, so if you do what I tell you, uh, you will do great in the exam. If you don't, you will not do great in the exam. That's sort of the simple thing, and I think that's sort of how, how education should nowadays be. Finally, finally, you know, in my days, so I don't know, still on with many other folks here at this university, the tough part is actually to get hold of the of the course material, and you spend so much time hunting down uh, notes, and you know they don't hand out any slides or anything like that. I think that's that's so last century. I think um, nowadays we live in a world where it's not the access to the information because that's not an issue at all anymore. But it's about doing something with it. So that's what I want you to do. So have a look at the exam preparation guide. It's on Blackboard. Uh, that really tells you about what to do about this exam. You know, I put it in both in the assignment and in syllabus. Have a detailed look at it, and uh, it hopefully should ease you 
for the exam. Well, of course, this is a lot of work. You know, I'm completely aware of that, uh, but the, but that's just how it is. And the key thing, the key thing to to remember in all this, in all this, is to uh, keep calm. You know, take one step at a time. It's absolutely fine. It's absolutely fine to be overwhelmed. We all are. That's just how these things are. Uh, the thing at university is it's, uh, it seems more more pronounced, but uh, but that's just how it is, you know. Uh, um, and, and it's absolutely fine, even if you don't understand everything from the beginning onwards. Just approach it one thing at a time, stay calm, and draw on the resources that you have. You have lots of resources. Look at the exam preparation guide on what to do. And you know, as I already mentioned before, I'm a big fan of study groups, uh, not only just because they also help you to keep calm but also because uh, uh, you can draw on the wisdom of the folks around you. And you know, as I said at the very beginning, these are the folks that stay with you long after you forgot about dudes with beards and, and colds and scarves and, and, and gray hair. Um, so uh, that's the folks that stay with you. That's the resource that you have. Make use of this resource. OK, so let's go. So it started with the last, with the last content that I had prepared, so uh, I, I'm quickly going back a little bit to what we talked about um, last time, these interviews. Then we jump into focus groups. That's a form of interview. And uh, lastly, I want to talk a little more about ethnographies. Okay, so these are very roughly the stuff that I, that I want to do. Uh, but most of the time, let's see if we, if we get there, and it's, it's actually uh, the ethnography at the end. So first, let me just briefly revisit this whole qualitative research approach. You know, it's sort of a different, different approach that has nothing to do with quality or non-quality. I think that's kind of a, a misguided term. But it's really this uh, idea that maybe some of the things that we study are not that easily uh, be put in numbers. Right? Maybe we just cannot put a number to something. And that's, that's a reasonable, reasonable objection, right? That's sort of a, um, something that we, that we need to think about. So maybe... Um, we just cannot pin everything down to numbers. I believe in numbers a lot, so I think we can do a lot with numbers and a lot of statistics is very powerful as well. And a lot of the distinctions that people used to make, I don't think they really hold anymore. I think that's, uh, that just doesn't make sense. But I see this point here that you might want to go into depth, like you might really want to try to, probe, to follow up on certain things. And that's just a very natural thing. Imagine I give you a survey, you fill it out, uh, you fill something out. You have a. You have a. You don't understand something. I don't. I don't get that feedback. I cannot react to that. Right? So in a qualitative paradigm, it's more like this whole reaction process. That then you say something, and then I say, "What do you mean by that? Could you explain this a little more? And uh, tell me more about that." And that can also can also give you new ideas about stuff that you had not had not thought about before. Right? And actually, I was talking with I was talking with Travis yesterday. You know Travis. He's running this, uh, this, uh, this, this other work for some, some company where they, where they designed a survey as well. But before they did that, they, um, they did some interviews with folks right, to see if they actually understand the survey. Right? And then using that information, they came up with a much better survey afterwards. Right? So you can explore things in, in a more unstructured way and then have some structured components afterwards. And I think that's sort of the way to go, to have, the, to have these, these multiple approaches, a bit like the, a bit like the RTE folks from, from last Monday do. You know, there's, uh, there's the, the interviews where they go into people's bedrooms, they film them, but at the same time, there's the survey afterwards, right? And then we get different perspectives on things. So there's stuff that qualitative research can do that maybe others cannot, but there are also certain weaknesses. So we, we need to be aware that maybe we shouldn't think of it in, in a representative way. You know, you cannot... You cannot, I don't know, do 10 interviews and tell me this is representative. Yeah. This is what RTE wants to show on television in a trailer, but it's not representative of, uh, of Ireland or of young generation or, or, or whatnot. I can, there's so many, so many arguments why that cannot be representative or why you uh, might not generalize from that. But that's really just some, some, some revision from last time that I wanted to follow up and that we know what we're talking about. And also talked about interviews. You know, and I highlighted the way that when we, when we do interviews, we should think about interviews in different ways, or you can think about it in different ways. First, you can think about an interview as, well, as I call it here, interview as a tunnel. That means you, you try to, 
get some information that you didn't know before, right? So some, some I don't know, what does the interviewee say about a certain topic? No. And then all the things that we talk about in surveys matter here as well. You need to have good questions, you need to have good question order, and uh, so on and so forth. People might say something because they want to look in a good way and, and, and stuff like that. Yeah. And that's sort of often a problem. You know, people have realized that, okay, when we, when we do interviews like that, if the whole purpose of it is to get hold of this information that is buried down there somewhere, um, there are a whole bunch of things that mess this, mess this up. Yeah. People present themselves in a certain way. You don't want to look stupid when there's a TV camera team in your bedroom. Yeah. You don't want to look like an idiot. Yeah. People, sometimes even in an unconscious way, we all do that all the time. We present ourselves in ways um, uh, that uh, that might not necessarily capture the thing of how we how we truly are. People <laughs> might think they remember stuff, but actually they don't. Right? Or maybe they just remember their perspective, but somebody else understood the situation in a very different way. Would have, would have come to a completely different conclusion about this. Uh, there's a there's an inherent reactivity in the, in the interview. So you know, just the pure, the sheer situation that there's somebody asking a question, somebody sitting there. You know, there's some uh, some context that is being provided that that um, that might uh, might confuse people or might lead them to say things in a certain way that they would not have done otherwise. Or maybe language cannot really express what people really think. But that's really just kept revisiting the stuff that I had uh, had last week, just very briefly. And the second one, when we then take this one step further and think about, okay, um, maybe there's other things we need to consider. I sort of people who do this kind of stuff realize, okay, the interview itself gives us information. Right? So it's about how people say something. How do they react when I ask them a provocative question? It's not what they, I don't really care about what they're going to say, but I, see, but I care about how they say that. Right? That's sort of how you can use an interview as well. And, uh, and good, good interviewers, they are very aware of, of these kind of things, right? So that the very fact that they are there in the interview. And then in the next step, you know, this interview is an interaction that is not just how others react, but they react to what you say, right? So um, when you say something less provocative, they react in a different way than when you say something provocative. And uh, that's this idea of the interview being a constant interaction between the respondent and the, then the interviewer. So that's stuff that people, that people think about when they do interviews, or that's worth thinking about if you think about doing interviews at some point. Okay, so let me briefly mention, this is sort of the stuff where we stopped last time. I had different types of interviews, and uh, you can, you know, you have all different typologies, and I'm, I'm never really a huge fan of these kind of typologies. I think, okay, let's just do it. Uh, let's give it a name, I don't care. Um, but the concept behind it here is how much control, and that's a useful, useful concept to think about, uh, how much control do you actually have in the interview? You know? How much do you control this situation? I'm going to interview you. How much control do I have? Do I know exactly the location? Do I have the exact question? Do I control the whole setting? Or is this more like I just wander around, I randomly walk into somebody and we have a conversation about whatever comes up. Right? So there I don't have fixed questions. I don't have a fixed topic. Right? I might not even have fixed persons that I want to talk about. This is now on the other end of that spectrum. Yeah? And that's sort of how we can then distinguish different types of interviews based on the level of control that you have, right? At the very top, it's sort of, um, I don't know, it's, it's conversational, there's no, there's not much level of control here. Like a researcher just has no fixed topic, there's just a discussion that emerges, no fixed questions, right? And then it can be what we call an unstructured interview, that is where you still don't have clearly defined questions, but you know really the topic, you really know what you want to talk about and you probe that and you, you try it in different ways with the people and you try to them to tell you, tell you the things. Then you can have semi-structured interviews. There you have questions, questions, uh, um, uh, formulations in your mind. You know, you have a sequence, you know, okay, first I want to talk about their relationship to their parents. Then I want to talk to those kids about their relationship to their friends. Then I want to talk about their relationship to 
I don't know, to, uh, to jobs, right? And that's sort of the things that you have in your mind, this map of the stuff that you want to cover, and that would be a, a semi-structured interview. But to be honest, this distinction between what is now unstructured, what is semi-structured, I don't know, there's sort of a wide spectrum here, does it really matter? I don't know. As long as you know that uh, there are different levels of control, and that with these different levels of control, um, the, the way people, the, the way this whole thing unfolds might, might change. And at the very, at the very controlled setup, you know, you have a structured, structured interview. Actually, this would be even, you know, you already have a survey and you just read the questions and people answer and then you tick the bottom, you know, the, the box, you know. That would be a structured, a structured interview. So there are these different levels of control that you can have. But let me move on and talk about um, focus groups. Focus groups. So, you know, I do all these kind of things for you. So actually yesterday I went to a focus group. Uh, just for the fun of it, I thought, how, how cool is it going to be if I can actually tell you about how these focus group, group groups work out. So somehow, you know, the university singles me out. Uh, I get these emails, the stuff that lands on my desk, and I don't know, on young scholars that are new to UCD or, or whatnot, you know how is UCD seen in the world, and they work on their branding campaign, and, and, and all, this, all this crap. I basically went there because they said there would be free lunch. And uh, so I, I, went, I went there, and I don't know if you ever participated in a focus group, something that marketing folks like to do. You know, they basically bring a bunch of people in the same room. Often there is free lunch. And, uh, and then they have them talk about stuff. Yeah. Uh, so a focus group in that sense is a form of qualitative research in which a group of people are asked about their perception, opinions, beliefs, and attitudes towards a product, service, concept, blah, 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 advertisement, or something like that. In our case yesterday was about this, you know, how UCD presents itself internationally. So they showed us these little clips about UCD, the global university, and they showed us clips from other universities, how they present themselves, and, you know, and then, and then they had us they had some, I don't know, some rough questions, but mostly it was really just some rambling off. Right? Just sit there and then, oh, I like that, or I like that, and some other people say something in a while. To me, these things are sometimes mysterious. I don't really know how they work. Uh, but that's sort of why, why I went there. You know, I really wanted to experience this. I want to see this. So it is a form of group interview. Right? There was a moderator, and there were maybe 10 of us, and the, and the moderator asked us to work in little teams, work in little groups. What are the unique things about university? You know, where are we great? What can we do so awesomely, right? Or where do we suck? And uh, so they had us work on these kind of things, and there was sort of a discussion, like an open discussion. And the moderators and some other marketing folks, you know, they observed how this whole thing unfolded, and they were interested in our interactions, and they were interested in how we how we, how we express certain things. Okay, so it's basically like sitting together like a group interview when you let the group go away. But you already see you're giving away a lot of control here, right? Giving away a lot of control and these things, they just unfold in, in mysterious ways, you know? Then you sit there and then there are some, some guys that just dominate the discussion and then they're just very loud. You know? Somehow, you know, I always, as I said, I get invited to these kind of things, some certain, certain events at UCD. So I always end up with, this, with my personal nemesis, yeah, who is uh, um, incredibly loud, this American woman. You know, I love Americans. I have a lot of good American friends. But she's just incredibly loud and dominating. And what the fuck? Yeah, shut up. <laughs> and she's just here. I won't tell you from which apartment she is. <laughs> She's from this college, I think. That's kind of why I run into her. But she's so eager, so eager. And, um, and that evolves a, a very specific dynamic that evolves around that, right? I always sit there and go, oh, God, Amber, come on, be quiet. Yeah. Strength of the focus groups, you can examine how people collectively construct or organize knowledge. That's what, they, what those marketing folks want to see. They, they want to see, okay, how do we come about thinking about what is great about UCD? Um, what are our thought processes in a way? It's so pretty much like spilling things out there. Yeah? And they want to understand why people hold certain views and they want to get a range of views. Yeah? So they, I don't know, they, they basically give it to us to, to define what 
what this, the, this campaign could be about. At the same time, you know, I see a lot of limitations for these kind of things as well. There's less control. As I said, this can be um, a rambling off thing. I'm very happy when they, when they explicitly say that these events go from, let's say, 12.30 to 1.30, right? because then I can always say I have something else afterwards. I just run away. At 1.30, I just run away. I don't care. And, uh, but then I wouldn't, want to be, I wouldn't want to be the marketing folks who actually analyze this thing afterwards. Right? But they have to make sense out of this. And that can be very difficult. What you see on the one side, it gives you, it gives you maybe more potential to explore new things that you haven't thought about, that you couldn't do in a survey, right? Maybe in a survey they would say, this is, this, are we great in this, this or that or so on, right? That's what you could do. But maybe during this focus group, some other things pop up that they hadn't thought about before, right? So that's where these focus groups can be, can be very strong, but it can also be very difficult to, to analyze this whole thing, kind of make sense out of it, to structure it in a certain way. It can be time consuming, yeah. And uh, there can be a tendency for agreement or, you know, as I tell you, it can really make you itchy and want to go away. It can cause you, cause you discomfort in these situations. So these are focus groups. Focus groups. Um, they, can be, they can be good to, to explore, explore new things that you, excuse me, <coughs> that you haven't thought about before. Uh, and, um, And people like to use it in marketing, it's very popular. It's very popular, but in, but in other spheres of the social sciences, you can, you can use focus groups as well. Okay, let me now move on and talk more about what we call ethnographies. Yeah, so focus group is essentially like a group interview. Right? An ethnography is sort of, when we look at the spectrum of how structured can it be to how unstructured can it be, ethnography is sort of this idea, you immerse yourself, you observe the whole thing, you become I don't know, you go native, you uh, join a tribe in Central Africa for a year and you live there and uh, that's where this comes from. That's where this comes from originally. Ethnographies come from um, anthropology, where people did that, you know, they, they um, found, um, it's often about observing groups of people, native tribes, that was the thing. But nowadays, you know, this research method has been applied, it's being applied much more into, this, into, into sociology, for example, as well. And people do ethnographies about all sorts of things. I do ethnographies about institutions. Uh, so some people embed themselves and observe how do the United Nations work. Uh, so they, they basically, whatever, sometimes they do an internship with the United Nations for a year, but they actually study the United Nations while they are there. Or a friend of mine, a good colleague of a friend of mine, James Densley, he, um, he basically embedded himself in a youth gang in London for two years. So he was hanging out with this youth gang. And you can see all the problems that this might create. Right? Suddenly you're with this gang, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit, and sometimes these things are very violent, right? There's criminal acts happening. What do you do as a researcher? Right? Do you say, no, I'm a researcher? Or do you say, or do you jump in and, and you participate in the violence? That's sort of a serious ethical issue that you need to sort out here. So ethical issues are, are very important when we talk about ethnographies. But let me, let me roll back a little bit and tell you first what ethnographies are. So ethnographies is a data collection technique that requires the researcher to be present at, involved in, and record the routine activities <coughs> with people in the field and the setting. And the idea is to identify the rules and the meanings that govern relationship and actions in the setting. Now, it's this idea of immersing oneself and we used to call that participant observation, that you got, became part of that and you observed it. But now ethnographies is sort of a, a broader category, a broader, a broader description of this, where you observe a group or a setting or how events work. You know, sometimes people do cool stuff, they do ethnographies at, uh, at rock concerts, right? They go to rock concerts and they see how do people behave there? How do they act? How do they walk? How do they dress? Kind of what shoes do they wear? What kind of shoes? What kind of sneakers? Right? Which color? These kind of things to understand these things seem to matter for them, right? Maybe in that, maybe in, for that culture it really matters. Do they have, which kind of shoelaces do they have? And which color do they have? These kind of things that you might not have thought about, but for that group it actually matters. It's a signal. Maybe they show something with that, and, and many youth cultures actually do that. They, um, 
they, they show things with their shoes, with the brands, with the shoelaces, all these kind of things, the way they dress, the way they talk, the kind of words they use, the way they interact, the way they interact with others, right? the kind of drinks they have. That's sort of an ethnography where you're immersing yourself, you observe, but then you also move further on, and then you talk with people about that. So in ethnographies, there's this participant observation component, but there's often also more than that. There's often also the interviewing stage where you then talk with people. Okay, so in ethnographies, the focus is usually on a single setting or group you know, of relatively small scale. You know, sometimes it's even just a single individual. It's really digging, digging deep. But keep in mind, that by doing so, by focusing on just one individual, you cannot necessarily generalize for the rest of the population. You might learn a lot of things about this particular individual, or about this particular event, or about this particular group, but you might not be able to generally say everybody is like that. Yeah. Just because this is what those folks on RTE say, this is not how the whole population thinks about, I don't know, certain issues. Okay, so a lot of it is about um, interpretation and uh, um, finding the meanings and the functions that people give to their actions or to their interactions and, and, and describe that in, in one way or the other. Right? So, I have to tell you, I've never done ethnographies myself. I'm, I'm fascinated by it. Uh, uh, to, me, uh, to me, it is really opening your eyes. Yeah? But uh, there are other folks that know much more about how these things work. So there are other causes about that. So what I brought with me now is uh, actually a little um, where folks that do ethnographies tell you about what they think what ethnographies are. Right? I think it always helps to hear from people who actually use these kind of things. So I have a little video from a bunch of students that did some ethnographies and um, give you their view on what it is and what is important. What is ethnography? There's not one right answer to the question. Ethnography can mean different things to different people. It can be part anthropology, part sociology, and part investigative journalism. This is what it means to us. In the simplest terms, ethnography is a picture or a portrait of a group of people. It's doing our best to describe something about a culture from the perspective of those inside the culture. The idea is to join a conversation already taking place and to learn what's important to people, what they value, and what they naturally talk about. It's letting people tell us who they are. Yes, of course, of course. We are uh, more highly emotional. But unlike other forms of research, ethnography admits our own cultural perspectives. For example, we were Americans in a Balkan space, Protestants in an Orthodox space, and conflict sheltered in a conflict ridden space. In this way, ethnography functions not only as a description of a foreign culture, but also as a commentary on our culture. It's only through our interaction with others that we discover our own biases, our own identities, and our own collective culture. Ethnography involves fieldwork, which necessitates interaction. We couldn't be afraid to get involved, to get our hands dirty. Several data collection methods were used, including outside research, observation, and interviews. In this way, we attempt to corroborate our findings in different ways. Ethnography is always adventurous. Ethnography is recognizing that everyone has a story. We had to see people as more than just data informants. It means really getting to know people. It's learning how to communicate with people who are different than us and seeking to understand them through being a good listener, asking open-ended questions, and letting whomever we are talking to direct the conversation. We interviewed in pairs, and so while one person asked the questions and engaged the interviewee, the other person took notes. In order to preserve the voices of our interviewees, 
we tried to write down everything we heard, to capture every word, even if it seemed trivial or insignificant at the moment. After interviewing for at least four hours a day, we typed up everything we'd written for the next several hours, which takes forever, by the way. Ethnography is writing and writing and writing. Then we went back and read everything we typed and tried to locate emergent themes. Once a week, we'd all meet together to discuss patterns and themes, bounce ideas off one another, reformulate the questions, and make sure we were all heading in the same direction. What other media is saying Ethnography is maintaining a level of academic professionalism at all times. This is the first impression of seven Americans in Serbia. Um, there are a whole bunch of famous ethnographies, you know, many of them being done, you know, as I mentioned, some examples, people looking at organizations, how organizations work, look at the United Nations, you know, you can do an ethnography of how the university works, for example, or um, criminology, some super fascinating stuff, you know, people look at how, um, how gang life works, so here, you know, you see they the, the spend time with gangs. There's one famous study um, by James Patrick. Actually, funnily, it's a, it's a pseudonym. So it's a guy who, who didn't dare to publish the work under his own name because it was dangerous. It was dangerous because he embedded himself in this gang and those guys didn't know that he was a researcher. It's part of investigative journalism. So actually, there was one guy in the gang who knew that he was a researcher. Uh, but everybody else didn't, and then you know the gang became very violent. They did a lot of violent acts, and they became very upset with this with this guy, you know, with uh, James Patrick, this pseudonym, uh, about why he didn't participate, why he didn't help in beating up those guys, or why he didn't didn't commit the crime together with them, right? So it put him in, in a very difficult situation. And as I said, you know, this, this friend of mine. James Ainsley did a similar stuff in, in London, but he was more overt about it, so everybody knew that he was the researcher. But he told me about these experiences that he made, it's just crazy stuff, you know, where he meets those gang members in the middle of the night in a parking lot, right? And there, are, I don't know, there are weapons in the back of the car, and what the hell are you doing, yeah? So, um, there are some, some very interesting problems that you need to face then, and also things that you can reveal that you would not have been able to reveal otherwise. Another famous study is uh, that of Irving Goffman. Maybe you came across him. You know, he's a famous, famous dude in social sciences. Irving Goffman basically studied um, asylums, mental health institutions, and uh, he essentially worked on the idea of institutionalization and uh, his work had real consequences. His work really led to a deinstitutionalization of mental health. Um, what he had observed was that as soon as people entered, now we're talking about the 1950s, 1960s, yeah, as soon as people entered psychiatry ward you know, at the time, there were completely new rules. It was like a total institution. He actually he compared it to monasteries in that sense. There were clear rules about how life works, what they have to do, how this goes. And you observed that uh, this had a massive, massive impact on people's, on people's life. Yeah. So he observed that, that this institutionalization itself um, could, could actually, instead of helping, helping uh, um, mentally, uh, mentally ill people, it actually contributed to mental health problems. Yeah. So that sort of was a way of um, how the mental health um, institutions look like, and, and, and the work of Goffman really, really made a difference in changing that then afterwards. So what he was doing, he basically embedded himself into this hospital. Now he got a job there. He got a job uh, as a, what's called a, an assistant physical activity manager. And it was like a big mental health institution, somebody who, I don't know, came up with daily activities and so on. So there he was, the, um, the assistant to the manager. And um, nobody, uh, nobody uh, in the institution 
except few knew that he actually was a researcher. So it was pretty, pretty much undercover. The patients didn't know. Most of his colleagues didn't know. Some of the superiors didn't know, but most of the people did not know. So now you can have a whole bunch of things that one needs to think about when you, when you go about doing, doing these kind of ethnographies. And the first one is, and um, ethnographers spend a lot of time on this. They spend a lot of time on getting access to the groups that they want to study. You need to get in there. How do you, how do you, how do you learn about how gang recruitment works in East London? I don't know, you just show up there and you ask somebody? That's just not how it goes. That's just not how it goes. You need to, you know, and James was telling me these stories about how he really had to learn, gain the trust of the folks there. Yeah. He really, he went through this vetting process, right? Several stages, he started off with some, you know, maybe the social workers or maybe the local hairdresser and talked with them and they recommended him to talk to somebody else and, you know, of course they all knew that, that there was this researcher now in town, right, and uh, so he had to really gain, gain the trust of the people and that's what, um, what we call, um, it's also called rapport, uh, but basically it's gaining trust, gaining access to uh, to the folks that you want to study and good ethnographers they spend a lot of time on these things and there are different strategies for that you know one of those, I don't know if you want to study a company go and get a job in this company so actually there are some ethnographies about folks who worked at McDonald's you know they, they got a job at McDonald's to see how how does the whole uh, interaction between between the employees work there how is the organization structured and so on uh, another famous guy Louis Wacom wrote this fascinating book Body and Soul where he basically joined a boxing club. Uh, he joined a boxing club, and for several years, the guy wrote his PhD thesis about this boxing club. Uh, he completely embedded himself, com completely into this, and, and learned how, how those folks interact, what they do, what drives them, you know, what are sort of the motivations, and so on. Or folks move around with certain groups, right? It's not just going somewhere. Some folks go to football matches, and they, stand, they position themselves in the middle of the hooligan group. To see, to see how how do they work? You know, how do they interact? Uh, what what drives them? In all of these things, you know, it is really about um, getting hold of these daily routine activities of whatever that group does, right? And for a gang, it might be crime. For uh, for a boxer, it might be it might be training. It might be uh, it might be fighting. For um, for a hooligan, it might be beating some other people up. Yeah? So it's, and, and then what people do, you know, they hang around, they shadow uh, to get into, into these different groups and learn about um, the norms and the values that people have. Okay, so um, having a sponsor can be useful in that sense, and that's also what happened in the case of, um, of James, you know, my, my, and this, this colleague of mine, who said that he had at some point convinced the, some leaders in that group that he was a nice guy. You know, that he sort of, you know, has no, 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 no harm to come from his side. Actually, they were curious about it, so they started vouching for him, and that's sort of how he gained, how he gained access into these different groups. Okay. So what do people do when they get access to that? You know, they immerse themselves, they observe a, a, a group, sometimes for a longer time, they go back again, you know, they talk with people. Uh, they want to understand what drives them, and then ethnographers, they take field notes. Yeah. Basically, they document. It's this writing, writing, writing stuff at the end of the day, about what were your experiences, and so on. Even though at this particular moment, you might not know, or you might not be aware if that is important or not, but it's, that's essentially the data that you're creating. That's, you're creating that data. Sometimes you can record it, you know, that makes your life easier as well, but sometimes you can't. I don't, I don't know, you're meeting in a very clandestine setting in a way, with, a, with some gang members in the middle of the night on a parking lot, you're not going to ask them, by the way, can I switch on my tape recorder? Yeah. That's not going to work. So there, then you need to memorize things, you need to write down your field notes, and you need to do that as quickly as possible. Okay, I had talked a lot already about some people going undercover. Yeah. And that's actually what um, people used to do a lot. People used to do a lot in ethnographies. We call that covert ethnographies or secret ethnographies, so basically nobody really knows that, uh, that they are actual researchers, you know, they blend in, 
It's like this uh, like a secret spy mission. And you can imagine this can cause a whole bunch of ethical problems. Just think of the, of the gangs, you know, you're becoming part of the gang and now, I don't know, they're thinking about killing somebody. What are you going to do? As a researcher, it's a, it's, well, in this case, I think it's, I don't know, we're talking about human lives, right? But let's say about, I don't know, some, some, some pity crime. Are you going to participate in that, right? Um, these are ethical, ethical issues. Sometimes it might be the only way. Imagine you want to study elites. Yeah. If you want to study elites, as soon as they realize that you're not part of the elite, they're not going to tell you about their things. Right? So you need to speak the language, you need to come credibly come across so that they open up. The whole point of it is that at the end of the day, they open up, that they let you in, that they tell you stuff about how, how, how they run. And sometimes, sometimes it's necessary for them to think that you're part of them. But it may also limit a researcher's abilities to do stuff. Imagine you got a job at McDonald's, right? Then you have to actually work there. Right? You cannot just wander around. Or you're in a factory. You cannot just wander around and interview some people. You have a job to do. That's sort of how, how you got your access. And if you, if you wouldn't do your job properly anymore, then people would realize there's something fishy with you. So that's sort of undercover stuff, which, which can raise a lot of ethical, ethical issues. That's stuff that should be aware of. The, the contrast to that is overt ethnographies. That's basically where you, where you are up front. You know, I say, hello guys, I'm a researcher. Here I am. And I, I want to learn more, more about what you do. Yeah. So there the role of the research is not hidden. People know they are being studied. And the idea is that you're a bit like the fly at the wall. You know, eventually they forget about you. Or sometimes they even, you know, they take you as their mascot or something like that. And that's how it actually happened in the case with with my colleague James, you know, kind of funny because he looked at this black youth gang in East London, and James is this super tall guy who's essentially an albino. Yeah. So there's obviously the guy cannot blend in, right? But because he's so different, because he was so different, then he was this researcher coming from Oxford, yeah, those guys, this is a completely different world for them. They don't know what the hell are you doing. Yeah. But at the same time, they were kind of curious, okay, let's, let's get the guy come along. Yeah. Let him have a look at how we beat some people up. And um, so he wrote this book, how gangs work, about how they recruit, how, uh, how their hierarchy internally work, how the whole system goes. And stuff that you could not, could not have found out with a survey or with an experiment or with some other things that we talked about so far. So when you do these kind of ethnographies, often you have gatekeepers that you need to think about. Gatekeepers are individuals who provide the researcher access to a setting or a group. You know, let's say I want, to, I, don't know, I want to study a group of people that have a certain illness. How, how am I going to get to that group? Right? I can go through, let's say, uh, a doctor, a GP, who might be able to refer me to a group of people. Right? Or, I don't know, that's sort of how, how, how gatekeepers, people sort of are at the entrance and, and allow you to enter a certain group. Then we can also talk about key informants. What are key informants? So basically, folks that are particularly good in helping you with collecting data, they tell you a lot. Right? So you go around, you want to know how this gang works, and then you sit in the local hairdresser, and then this guy comes along and really tells you, this is how the gang works. And they think, oh, how great is that? I got the guy. He tells me everything about this gang. Right? He's a key informant. That's how we call it, a key informant, somebody who tells you a lot. Something to keep in mind is that this key informant, he might be marginal at at the group that we're talking about, right? Maybe the guy who works at the hairdresser shop, he would like to be part of this gang, he observes it from outside, but he's not really part of it, right? So when you are a researcher, when you have your gatekeepers and you have your key informants, you need to be aware that uh, the key informants might be marginal in their own set, you know, or they might not be actually at the very center of it. So when you do these kind of ethnographies, now that's sort of this, this, this spectrum, which is, which is uh, sometimes hard to grasp, but uh, um, there's this tension that you have or how you can present yourself. On the one side, you can present yourself as uh, the, uh, the acceptable incompetent, right? You're kind of a guy who has no clue about how a gang works, but you present yourself as, I'm eager to learn. I want to know about this stuff. Could you please tell me? Right? And I'm sort of acceptable by them because maybe I'm so different. 
So that's sort of the acceptable incompetent on the one side. And a lot of most researchers, most ethnographers take that approach. They are very upfront. They really take, tell people, hang on, guys, I don't know about this. I would like to learn about it. Then on the other side, and that happens sometimes as well, people go native. So they become too much like the people in the setting. And that's something to really be aware of because it can completely cloud people. It can completely judge, uh, um, judge uh, their assessment of the things. They become too much part of the group, right? So that they actually don't really have an objective view on that anymore. But that's sort of ethnography. You know, there's much more exciting stuff about that. If you're interested in that, I think we have a bunch of courses in the, in the second or third year being offered by some of my colleagues about ethnographies. I had some more things, but let's not talk about that. So uh, now we reach the finishing line in terms of the material that I wanted to present to you. How awesome is that? So next week, we only do revisions. So if you have some questions or if you have some stuff that you want me to revisit, let your tutors know, and uh, we come back to the things that might not have been today so far. Okay, thanks very much.